This is Europe and the United States in the 20th century and today we are on class number 13 entitled From the New Cold War to the End of the Cold War and this class basically will survey the 1980s. So the first part we will discuss this period I suppose which has, as I guess extends from the late 70s through to the mid 1980s which is sometimes referred to as the New Cold War or the Second Cold War. I think rather misleadingly, but we will come on to that. And then the latter half of the 1980s, in which there are a series of major uh, changes to the superpower relationship. This is obviously the period of Reagan and Gorbachev, uh, which ultimately culminates um, in the year of miracles in 1989 in which the Berlin Wall comes down and basically the Soviet Union well uh, uh, begins its withdrawal from its empire in Eastern Europe and you see the collapse of various governments right uh, various communist governments right across Eastern Europe okay this slide by way of an introduction um, in the last class, if you recall, we talked a little bit about the 1970s, a period known, which largely coincided a period of the Cold War, which was known as détente, uh, the French word, which broadly means uh, relaxation. And as the first point on the slides here says, détente basically produces a period of relative Cold War stability. Um, so super superpower tensions, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union were significantly reduced. Produ did produce several significant accomplishments, the two SALT treaties, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties, SALT 1, 1972, SALT 2, 1979. Um, also, I mentioned last time the Helsinki Final Act, which in some ways I think is the high watermark of the detente period. Um, the third point there also leading to a greater level of European independence. I suppose that the most striking manifestation of this was West Germany's Ostpolitik in which the West German government pursued its own version of detente. There were certainly disputes over um, uh, burden sharing um, in the 1970s, particularly during the Nixon administration. You know, Nixon in 1969 unveils the so-called Nixon Doctrine, in which he basically calls upon America's allies to bear a greater uh, degree of the burden. Um, and again, early 70s, I think this is perhaps more true of the Nixon administration than later administrations, but certainly in the Nixon administration, you get a sense that neither Nixon nor Kissinger viewed Europe as being particularly important in sort of strategic terms, geopolitical terms from the American standpoint. Um, Deton though comes to an end and I sort of ran out of time in the last class so it might be worth just dwelling slightly more on why this period of relative Cold War stability basically unravels at the end of the 1970s. And I make a couple of points here. First, and I think probably the most significant reason was that both superpowers had rather different interpretations of rather different views of what detente was and what it obliged them to do, particular behaviour. Um, I think from the American perspective, detente is containment by another name. I think jo I think John Lewis Gallius sort of makes this point in his book, which was essentially containment by another na name. Um, essentially, again, we explore some of the concepts, you know, Nixon, Kissinger, sort of viewing the Soviet Union as a kind of recalcitrant donkey, which had to be one way or the other, you know, its behaviour had to be moderated. And you did that with either by offering inducements so-called carrots or sticks. In other words, you would punish the Soviet Union if it misbehaved. So as I say, detente from the American perspective was a sort of diplomatic strategy in order to, as I say, try and moderate Soviet behavior. From a Soviet perspective, 
as I say, there, the third point, um, the Soviets basically viewed detente as a sort of recognition of equality, that the United States was now treating them as an equal partner on the world stage. Um, but for the Soviets, the taunt was very much a sort of continuation of the Cold War. So in that sense, from the Soviet perspective, it was business as usual. So you can see how these two rival um, visions, views, begin to clash by the late 70s, particularly, I mean, I think one of the main reasons for why detente comes to an end are Soviet activities in the developing world, in Africa, but most spectacularly, I suppose, is the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Now, from the Soviet perspective, they can't quite understand what the problem is. Uh, as I say, for them, the, it's the Cold War, business as usual. From the American perspective, though, as I said, this, these sorts of actions run counter to the spirit of detente. So from, there, from the American perspective, this is basically Russian treachery, almost, or that the Russians are reneging on some of the core principles of detente. Another point I make there is that Nixon especially, I think, did oversell detente at various junctures. There were suggestions that he was going to bring the Cold War to an end. As I said, you know, the underlying causes of the Cold War, though, certainly were not, certainly did not disappear. I mean, if you think the Cold War essentially begins because of Europe's division, the fact that Stalin consolidates his grip over Eastern Europe, imposes communist Stalinist governments on Eastern Europe. Uh, well, the communist empire still very much remained um, in the 1970s. But as I say, the root causes of the Cold War certainly did not disappear. So as I say, superpower competition continues. Again, some of the points I made in the last class, and I probably won't won't dwell on them too much but as i say you know detente ends largely as a consequence of soviet activities in the developing world notably in africa as a cuban troops deployed in angola and ethiopia cuba being acting as a sort of soviet proxy um, in africa in the 1970s then you have the diplomatic catastrophe from the american perspective of the Iranian Revolution in 1979. So overnight, Iran goes from being one of America's closest allies in the Middle East to, to having a government of unrelenting en enmity towards the United States. Uh, then Christmas Day, 1979, the Soviets invade Afghanistan, which is not spelled properly there. I'm not quite sure why an H has appeared, but never mind. Um, and as I, I've said this before, but I think Afghanistan is basically the last nail in detente's coffin. Uh, so the Soviet invasion, basically, as I say, I mean, detente was already in deep trouble even before Afghanistan. But that, but the Soviet invasion basically kills off detente in 1979, at least from the American perspective. As I said, the kind of European reaction is somewhat different to the United States, or at least, you know, the... The European reaction is nothing like as strident as that of the United States. But again, this is President Carter, President of 1979. And as I say, from his perspective, this is an act of overt aggression. There were certainly fears in the US government that this was the beginning of a larger Soviet move into the Eastern, uh, into the Middle East. So, you know, first of all, Afghanistan, there may be a move into Iran or countries in that region. Uh, again, I think it's important to bear in mind the context of the Middle East in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution, which had also you know, delivered a hammer blow to American influence and prestige in the world. Um, one way that the United States responds, well, several ways the United States responds, first of all, imposing sanctions against the Soviet Union. We will get onto that in a moment. Uh, just uh, by, as a way of contrasting European and American reactions uh, and, and, and approaches to the Eastern Bloc in the 1980s. Um, I think I mentioned this in the previous class as well. You see, you witnessed the boycotting of, of the Olympics in Moscow in 1980. The Soviets do the same in the 1984 Olympics, which were held in Los Angeles. 
and the United States begins to covertly supply weapons to the Mujahideen, these are the sort of Islamic forces, Islamic Afghan forces, which are fighting, I say Afghan, but a number of foreign fighters appear, um, including, of course, one Osama bin Laden, who would later achieve notoriety. Um, and again, as I've said before, I think that, you know, that, 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 that the covert operation um, at the time is viewed as chalked up as very much a sort of CIA success in the sense that Afghanistan basically becomes uh, the Soviet's equivalent of Vietnam in the 1980s and kind of the sort of Red Army is basically dragged into a quagmire in Afghanistan. Um, but of course, you know, <laughs> Um, 10 years after the Cold War, slightly over 10 years after the Cold War, um, you know, the policy of supplying weapons to radical Islamic fighters, uh, that does not look quite so, uh, quite so wise after the event. Um, and yeah, as I say, Carter Doctrine unveiled um, in 1979, in which Carter publicly proclaims that the United States would oppose any further Soviet move into the Persian Gulf. Okay, again, I think I've mentioned this briefly, but I think, again, it's worth considering in some detail uh, the European reactions to Afghanistan. Uh, first of all, Britain under Margaret Thatcher. We'll talk more about Thatcher in a moment, but she became Prime Minister of Britain, spring of 1979. Um, and you know, hardcore conservative, cold warrior. Again, we'll talk, as I say, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about a biography in a moment. Um, but she, unsurprisingly, is pretty supportive of the American position. She, you know, she shares Carter's concerns about uh, the Soviet invasion uh, of Afghanistan. Should be said, I mean, the justification for the Soviet invasion is that a Marxist government briefly comes to power in Afghanistan and is then sort of overthrown, I think, in a military coup. Um, so the rationalization for the Soviet invasion is that they are, you know, is that they are sort of moving into Afghanistan in order to restore um, a Marxist government. Um, so this was sort of the Brezhnev doctrine in action, where the Soviets basically uh, proclaimed the right to militarily intervene in order to protect communist governments. Um, but as I say, Thatcher basically shares American concerns on this. France and Germany, in contrast, issue a statement saying that another crisis of this kind would kill detente. Um, essentially saying that, yes, Afghanistan was a big problem, but not sufficient to actually end detente. So in other words, France and Germany were still sort of committed to, to uh, uh, um, um, continuing with detente policies. Uh, I don't think I've got it here on there, but Helmut Schmidt, who was the West German Chancellor, in 1979, uh, I think I had this on the on the slide in the previous class, but you know, he says basically says, you know, we're not going to allow this to derail. Well, obviously, it weren't his exact words, but words along his lines. House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, um, in the United States uh, not at all happy <laughs> with this with these European reactions, uh, proclaiming that the reactions of the Allies have been found wanting. The fact that that that, that essentially. European governments did not entirely share the American view that Afghanistan constituted a significant blow against uh, detente. Moreover, and again, this sort of fuels American resentment, I suppose, when it comes to uh, its relations with its European allies, um, a contract that the United States has signed with the Soviet Union for steel mill and an aluminium plant uh, that gets cancelled as a result of american sanctions but european firms i think especially in germany basically step in to fill the gap so in other words the european sort of profit that the united states government decides to impose these sanctions that too sort of fuels uh, american uh, resentment should also be noted though you know 1979 1980 uh, these were not good years for the international economy including the european economies so i think most european governments and that by 1980 
their economies were in recession. So again, there, there was a reluctance, I think, to be to impose stringent sanctions against the Soviet Union because it would basically sort of weaken. Um, uh, it would kind of go against the, you know the economic and business interests of of, of, of the Europeans. Um, Early 80s as well, the Soviets do actually announce a unilateral reduction of 20,000 troops. Again, I think a reflection of the fact that the Soviet economy was also running into difficulties. But, I mean, it's interesting in terms of the Soviet Union's approach to Europe. Uh, there is a real lack of consistency. On the one hand, at various junctures, there are sort of peace offensives that the Soviets embark upon. And there's, I think, a continual desire right the way through the Cold War to try and drive a wedge between the Western Europeans and the United States. On the other hand, they take decisions which um, basically seem to run counter to this strategy, uh, most notably the deployment of the SS-20, which as we've discussed before, late 1970s, basically drives the Western Europeans back into the arms of the United States. So there's a real lack of consistency and uh, one explanation for all this uh, which uh, I know John Lewis Gaddis, uh, I, 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 I once asked a question <laughs> to him about this. Uh, yeah, one explanation for this is that it was kind of reflected the fact that there was an absence of sort of checks and balances within the Soviet system, that there weren't, if you like, people within the Soviet foreign ministry or the national security structure who could sort of um, challenge the decisions that were being made by the Politburo, um, you know, question whether they sort of fitted into uh, uh, the Soviet Union sort of overarching, uh, arching its strategy. And that, so, you know, his his explanation was it was basically a sort of lack of democratic accountability in the Soviet Union as much as anything that sort of explained these inconsistencies. Uh, anyway, that's slight, that was a slight tangent there, but I think it's sort of interesting to note. Um, 1980, an election year, um, and the Republicans decided that they will have re um, uh, Ronald Reagan as their standard bearer. Uh, Reagan had almost captured the Republican nomination in 1976. He challenges uh, Gerald Ford for the presidency. Uh, 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 sorry, for, 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 the re for the Republican nomination to the presidency, I should say. Um, but was defeated, uh, but only narrowly defeated at the Republican convention in 1976. Reagan stands again in 1980, and this time he is successful. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about, about his biography. One thing I would note in passing, though, is that Reagan sort of comes from the very conservative wing of the Republican Party. Uh, and, you know, I think to some extent... In the 70s, he's sort of viewed as a kind of wild man in American politics. So there are, there are plenty of people who have sort of reservations about Reagan and the idea of Reagan as president, late 70s and into 1980. Nonetheless, as I say, he captures the Republican nomination um, and then goes on to defeat Jimmy Carter. Poor old Jimmy Carter uh, only has one term as president, but really it's his foreign policy failures and the Iranian revolution especially which I think destroys his uh, destroys his presidency. You have a very protracted hostage crisis, which you know lasts for weeks all the way through the 1980 election campaign. American prison American uh, prisoners in Iran, uh, you know, the diplomats weren't released until the first day of Reagan's presidency um, in, in the beginning of 1981. Um, Reagan, as I say, has something of a reputation for being the wild man of, 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 of American politics. Um, but his campaign in 1980, very notable for his optimism. Again, I think the context is quite important. The 1970s obviously have not been a good decade for the United States. You have Watergate, massive political scandal, which leads to the resignation of an American president. Um, defeat in Vietnam. Uh, the American economy had been uh, had been had a, had had a pretty miserable decade. You'd had things like stagflation, um, America's having to queue for petrol pumps, all the rest of it. Um, 
What is notable about Reagan's 1980 campaign is its unbridled optimism. As this quotation here kind of suggests, America had lost faith in itself, he says here. We had to recapture our dreams, our pride in ourselves and in our country. If I would be elected president, I wanted to do what I could to bring about a spiritual revival in America. One of the things that Reagan really chooses to fight against is this idea of American decline in the early 1970s. You know, as Reagan says, uh, you know, it's morning in America, he says, you know, America's best days lay ahead. So I say unbridled optimism. Um, other things to note about Reagan, though, first and foremost, he was um, fiercely anti-communist and famously he described the Soviet Union as the evil empire. This was to in an address to, I think it was some kind of convention of American evangelical Christians. So he chose his language quite carefully and for the appropriate um, audience. Nonetheless, I think it did sort of reflect the view that Reagan sees the Cold War in these sorts of moralistic and indeed even Manichean terms, that this was a struggle between good and evil. Um, and that sort of reflects his attitude towards the Soviet Union. As you might recall, I think in the last lecture, last class, we mentioned the fact that Reagan himself was very, very critical of the detente policies of the Nixon administration in the early 1970s, despite the fact that Nixon was a fellow Republican. Um, so as I say, yeah, this 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 worldview, this outlook, I think, does very much um, influence Reagan's decision making. Um, Reagan, part of the new right, and the new right have been very sort of critical of uh, the containment policies that successive American administrations have pursued since the beginning of the Cold War. In their eyes, containment was simply too defensive. Uh, you know, they asked themselves, well, it's okay to contain the Soviet Union, but surely we need to go beyond containment. Um, and they asked the question, what are we doing, in fact, to try and win the Cold War? Um, and Reagan's answer to that was to basically sort of ratchet up American defense spending uh, and some statistics there. I mean, we recalled the fact that under Carter, uh, America had already begun its defense buildup. Um, so it says here, 1976, the United States was spending about $181 billion on defence. This had jumped, though, quite significantly um, by about $60 billion to $242 billion in 1982. And that trajectory, or that trend, maybe I should say, continues um, up to $270 billion in 1984. Of course, in today's terms, this is sort of peanuts. I mean, the US today spends about 700 billion or so, but obviously these are 1985 uh, dollars. So, uh, you know, this, you know, this was a significant chunk of money, to say the least, that the United States was spending on defense. Um, and Reagan's view was, first of all, that he, while he did not rule out the idea of negotiating with the Soviet Union, his argument was that the United States needed to negotiate from a position of strength. Furthermore, he said that if there was going to be an arms race, then this was an arms race that the United States would be able to win. You know, Reagan pointed to the weaknesses in the Soviet economy and essentially, I think he says, in fact, uh, to an audience of newspaper editors who said, you know, well, there is an arms race going on, but only one side is racing. In other words, the Soviets was, would simply not be able to kind of keep up. So part of the idea was to try and almost bankrupt the Soviet Union, force it into a position of submission. Um, other facts, a renewed emphasis on nuclear superiority. So this idea of parity, I suppose, which had underpinned uh, uh, the detente yeah, the detente period, uh, that was effectively jettisoned under Reagan. Um, again, I'll say, so the nuclear build-up suddenly uh, uh, um, accelerates under the Reagan administration. Moreover, Reagan has his own particular pet project, which was 
known as the Strategic Defense Initiative, more popularly dubbed as Star Wars. This was a kind of missile defense system involving satellites, lasers, very high tech, very sci-fi, which was the reason why it was described as Star Wars. But Reagan has this vision of lasers intercepting incoming Soviet strategic nuclear missiles. So, for, you know, in Reagan's view, this potentially could actually neutralize the Soviet Union's strategic uh, uh, st Soviet Union strategic nuclear capability. Um, added to that is that the rhetoric of the Reagan administration is extremely loose when it comes to the possibility of using nuclear weapons. In fact, there's even discussion about the, this idea of the United States potentially winning a nuclear war. So the rhetoric itself becomes decidedly more aggressive in the early 1980s. Again, reflecting Reagan's view that you know, containment was too defensive, that the United States needed to go beyond containment and actually try and proactively, if you like, win the Cold War. Uh, unsurprisingly, therefore, relations between the United States and the Soviet Union become increasingly strained in the early 1980s, leading to um, political commentators uh, historians is then to talk about a new Cold War or a second Cold War. This obviously doesn't be begin with Reagan, as we talk, as we mentioned, you know, detente basically unravels under uh, the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Um, but the strains become even more apparent in the early 1980s. So in this context, bringing the Europeans back into the picture, that we need to talk, need to consider some of the political changes which were afoot in Europe at that time. And in particular, it's worth noting that a new generation, I say a new generation, actually they were all to varying degrees relatively old, okay. But there was basically a changing in the political guard um, on the European scene. Um, in the early 1980s, uh, or in Thatcher's case, right at the end of the 1970s. So three pictures here. On the far left, of course, I'm sure we all recognise this lady, uh, Margaret Thatcher, um, who became British Britain's Prime Minister, as we mentioned, spring of 1979. And she's in power for just over a decade. She finally resigns or retires, I suppose, um, in uh, the autumn of 1990. Um, so, you know, her premiership really sort of coincides with the 1980s, but she's still just about in power to see the end of the Cold War, although not the demise of the Soviet Union itself. Then 1980, he says, trying to remember, 1981, uh, Francois Mitterrand is elected president of France and he is in office for 14 years. Back then, the term of a French president was seven years. It was Jacques Chirac, actually, who uh, um, uh, I think 2002 um, um, changed that to a five year term. My phone alarm just uh, notifying me. Um, and Mitterrand, notable for being the first socialist president of the Fifth Republic. He'd been a long time rival of de Gaulle, but had finally risen to the presidency himself at the beginning of the 1980s. Um, and then finally, the third picture, we have Helmut Kohl, who becomes a Christian Democratic Chancellor in West Germany. And he take he becomes Chancellor right at the end of 1982, when the Social Democratic government in West Germany basically collapses. And he's in power for a long time as well. He's Chancellor of West Germany from 1982 till 1998. Um, so yeah, all three very much um, long-term leaders, let's say, of their respective countries. Thatcher, the shortest, a mere 11 years she was as Prime Minister of Great Britain. Okay, let's take each of these in turn in a bit more detail. Thatcher, famously dubbed as the grocer's daughter. So she came from a sort of lower middle class background. Um, 
but eventually emerges to become leader of the Conservative Party. Very much a surprise choice as leader for a variety of reasons. For a variety of reasons, one she had not really served in a very senior position in previous Conservative governments. Um, she was not part of the grandees, let's say, within the Conservative Party. So she not she was not somebody who was. Uh, uh, you know, associated with you know, with 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 previous major leaders, let's say, in 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 the Conservative Party, and then of course you have her sex, the fact that she was a woman, and the Conservative Party in the nineteen seventies was not by any by any stretch of the imagination a feminist supporting movement. Um, nonetheless, uh, they decide that they've had enough of Edward Heath and Thatcher stands against Heath for the leadership. She challenges Heath for the leadership of the Conservative Party. I think many people were thinking that uh, her leadership challenge would probably lead to Heath's resignation um, and then that other senior figures in the Conservative Party would stand and one of them would actually win. Um, in the event, Thatcher challenges Heath and then goes on to win the subsequent leadership election. And as I said, she is a surprise choice. Um, and she is a very much a different style of conservative leader. Um, you know, as I say, until then, most conservatives have been sort of aristocrats, part of a landed gentry, or at least, uh, you know, relatively rich, if I can put it that way. Uh, Heath was a partial exception because he'd actually been to a grammar school. Um, uh, but he'd sort of, I suppose, insinuated his way into into the upper echelons of the Conservative Party. Thatcher, in contrast, very much was unapologetic, let's say, for her middle, you know, lower middle class background. Moreover, she was very much on the sort of new right in the Conservative Party. Uh, her she was very much a sort of disciple of Hayek in terms of her political thinking. Um, and as this quotation here is, you know, it suggests, you know, Margaret Thatcher, each time you go further along the socialist road, nearer and nearer to the communist state, then the consequences of the communist state will follow. And that very much sort of reflects that kind of Hayekian thinking, this idea that if you wanted to increase freedom, you needed to roll back the state. She was a fierce anti-communist almost as soon as she becomes leader of the Conservative Party. She's attacking the Soviet Union. She's attacking its human rights record, leading to... Uh, the Soviet newspaper Pravda doing her the huge favour of describing her as being the Iron Lady, uh, a description that uh, she revelled in. Mitterrand, as I say, France's uh, 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 or the Fifth Republic's first socialist president elected in 1981. Um, and this being France, Mitterrand was a proper dyed in the wool socialist president so not you know it's not some sort of soft lefty um however there is this sort of paradox i suppose in french politics that um presidents on the left in french politics tend to be more supportive of the united states so you know whereas de gaulle obviously you know a hallmark of de gaulle's foreign policies in the 1960s was to try and distance france uh, from America's policies um, in the 1980s, yeah, despite their different ideological backgrounds, actually Mitterrand and Reagan got on relatively well. He had something of a love-hate relationship with Thatcher as well. I mean, I think, again, in terms of their politics, very, very different. On the other hand, I think they were sort of, there was a sort of element of mutual admiration uh, between Thatcher and Mitterrand. As we noted here, you know, France's links with the military, uh, uh, France's links with military NATO secretly strengthened in the 1980s. So, you know, reflecting the fact that there was some sort of tacit cooperation between the two countries. Um, United States sort of promised to maintain support for the French nuclear program. Um, one thing that is quite notable is that by the early 80s, the European nuclear deterrent, European meaning Britain and France's nuclear weapons uh, themselves basically begin to pack a considerable punch 
Uh, so, so it's notable, early 1980s, Britain and France between them um, possess about 2,000. That seems a lot. Actually, I'm not entirely sure about the statistic, actually. Uh, I'll perhaps have to check that. Anyway, but the point being, uh, maybe it was 200. I'm not sure. But anyway, but in terms of their actual um, power, um, the, between them, the British and the French had the equivalent of the of the sort of nuclear uh, destructive capability of the United States in 1960 or the Soviet Union in 1972. In other words, um, the European nuclear deterrent was no longer, you know, a minor factor, let's say, in the Cold War. You know, potentially had the British or the French uh, um, used their nuclear deterrence, you know, they could have packed in themselves a considerable punch. I mean, still dwarfed by what the Americans and the Soviets actually possessed. But nonetheless, it was, um, you know, they were... They were, it was significant. Uh, Mitterrand again sort of reflecting the differences between the French left uh, and those of other leftist parties on the European continent. Uh, Mitterrand, unlike the Social Democrats in Germany, for example, who basically become divided and the government collapses on, on, on the nuclear issue, uh, Mitterrand, in contrast, does actually support the deployment of cruise and Pershing missiles into Europe. Cruise and Pershing being medium range missiles that NATO had agreed to deploy at the end of the 1970s in order to counter uh, the uh, the SS-20. I mean, NATO pursued what was known as a dual track strategy um, in the early 1980s. So sort of negotiating with the Soviets on the SS-20, but also preparing for their own deployments if those negotiations failed to reach some kind of agreement. But as I mentioned, Chancellor Cole comes to power, so the Christian Democrats come back into office. Uh, I think, as I say, the Christian Democratic, sorry, start again, the Social Democratic government in West German politics collapses in 1982 when the SPT basically divides on the issue of nuclear weapons and especially the deployment of cruise and Pershing missiles. Cruise and Pershing were to be, de you know, were, were slated to be deployed on West German territory. Um, Helmut Schmidt, who was on the conservative wing of the Social Democrats, supported the deployment, but there were plenty of others in his, in his party who didn't. And as I say, the party splits and the government collapses in 1982, making way for the Christian Democrats. Uh, Cole wins um, an election in 1983. So from this point onwards, from, well, really for the next, what was it, 16 years, uh, the Christian Democrats were in power. Um, and I think it's fair to say of the, you know, of the two parties in, of the two main parties in West German politics, the Americans have a much closer relationship with the Christian Democrats. So you now have a reasonably pro-American government. Not, that's not to say the Social Democrats in the 70s were particularly anti-American, but yeah, I think relations between the United States and the Christian Democrats were somewhat warmer than they had been under the Social Democrats in the 1970s. Um, Cole, pro-American, and also supports Cruz and Pershing. These are the INF, meaning Intermediate Nuclear Forces. So also supporting the Cruz and Pershing deployment. Um, as I say, slated for Europe in the 1980s. Generally speaking, I think, you know, having mentioned the fact that you have now got three major European leaders who all in slightly different ways, but all in, in their own ways, supporters of the sort of transatlantic relationship. Uh, unsurprisingly, I think there is a general warming of the transatlantic relations. Um, one thing which is worth noting is that burden sharing as an issue basically disappears in the early 1980s, mainly because the Reagan administration is more than happy to spend money on nuclear weapons, uh, sp sorry, spend money on defending Europe, regardless of what the Europeans do in return, um, which again is sort of is is notable. Um, so, you know, the issue which bedevils the transatlantic relationship in the 1970s, as I say, with Reagan coming into power, that is no longer so much of an issue. You know, Reagan, Reagan is quite happy to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on defence and not demand too much in return from the Europeans. 
Um, so as I say, first point there, you know, obviously the Europeans sort of welcome this renewed American connect commitment to the European continent. On the other hand, there is some alarm by the sort of loose talk coming out of the Reagan administration. So when, you know, the Americans start talking about this idea of winning a nuclear war, this unsurprisingly sets off European alarm bells. Um, then there are various American unilateral policies, so policies that the Reagan administration implements without consulting fully with its European partners. Again, the issue of consultation as a sort of European bugbear that does not disappear in the 1980s. One notable example of this is that the United States invades the Caribbean island of Grenada in 1983 mainly because a sort of Marxist government with links to drugs cartels had come to power. Uh, Reagan decides he's had enough uh, and, and he wants to replace the government, which would have been fine had it not been for the fact that Grenada was part of the British Commonwealth. Um, and nobody in the Reagan administration had thought to actually ask the British first if they were OK with this. In fact, apparently Reagan um, Reagan basically asks um, uh, the congressional leadership to the White House in order to brief them, brief them on the forthcoming invasion. You know, it was supposed to happen within a couple of hours or something like that. And you know, one of the congressional representatives—I forget exactly who it was—but says, "Hang on, isn't isn't you know isn't Grenada part of the Commonwealth? You know, has anybody actually told the British government?" And Reagan sort of goes, "Uh oh." And, quickly picks up the phone to Thatcher. But yeah, I mean, the British not at all happy that that, that, that the Americans do this. Should also be said that the, that the head of state in Grenada was uh, Queen Elizabeth, which, you know, so, so, yeah, as I say, you know, notionally still part of the British Empire. Um, also, Europeans were generally opposed to the United States bombing of Libya in 1986. Uh, Reagan decides that decides to bomb Libya in retaliation for the fact that uh, uh, Gaddafi had sort of sponsored various terrorist acts um, against uh, you know against Western interests, um, and you know even Thatcher was somewhat sceptical about this decision, although unlike other European countries, she does allow the United States to use um, American air bases inside Britain. Uh, this was mainly as a sort of gesture of thanks for the support that the United States had given the British during the Falklands War too. Um, other areas where you can find some disagreements between the Europeans and the Americans. Um, Europeans refused to impose sanctions against the Soviet Union after the martial law in Poland. In fact, there's an article on the reading list entitled The European Chicken Littles, which sort of reflect the fact that the Reagan administration was not entirely happy about this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the European economy was in some difficulties in the early 1980s and therefore you know there was a reluctance not to sort of sever their trading uh, links with the Soviet with the Soviet bloc you know European companies were benefiting from various contracts um, so you know the Reagan administration you know resented the fact that the, that the European firms were sort of profiting um, in the early 1980s despite you know despite the changed Cold War situation Europeans sort of resent the extraterritorial trade sanctions that the United States imposes. This gets slightly technical, but basically the Reagan administration imposes sanctions um, against American subsidiaries operating in Europe. So if you were part of an American company, even if you were not actually you know, that particular um, subsidiary wasn't actually was in Europe as opposed to the United States. Nonetheless, um, American sanctions policies would apply to that. Uh, the Europeans, you know, as I say, unsurprisingly, uh, take umbrage at this. They don't think, you know, they, they don't think it's the job of, of, of the US Congress to pass laws that affect uh, businesses which are operating in Europe. Um, how much Schmidt comes out, you know, for all a quotation that for all practical purposes US policy has taken on a form that suggests an end to friendship and partnership which is kind of hard 
hitting words. We've also noted the you know the, the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee talking about that the reactions of, of of the Europeans have been found wanting. So there were sort of tensions, you know, there were sort of underlying tensions between the two sides. Um, also some concerns on the part of the Europeans about Reagan's economic policies in the early 1980s as well. The fact that uh, the United States um, was borrowing an awful lot of money to, to fund um, the, um, the American uh, military build up. Um, many Europeans felt that this was potentially sort of destabilizing to uh, to uh, to the international economy. So the fact that the Americans were racking up so so much debt, the United States basically goes up goes from at the beginning of the 1980s being the world's largest creditor nation to by the end of the 1980s being the world's largest debtor nation. Um, and actually, you know, you look at the huge huge American debt. Uh, that the United States has today, uh, much of that basically stems from Reagan's policies in the 1980s. Um, it's worth noting, for example, Clinton, when he becomes president in the 90s, you know, he's he's sort of he, he, on a number of occasions privately, Clinton expresses his frustration with Reagan. The fact, you know, Reagan is considered to be this great American president, but as far as Clinton's concerned, you know, he's saddled the United States with all this debt. Um, now, by 1983, the Cold War enters a particularly dangerous phase. And 1983, I think, is a particularly grim, grim period in terms of the Cold War. I would say is probably uh, um, okay. This is my estimate, I, I suppose. Uh, so I don't necessarily take this as absolute truth, but yeah, in my view, probably 1983 is probably the closest the two sides come to some kind of direct military engagement since the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. I can't think of another comparable kind of period uh, post-Cuba in which the United States and the Soviet Union seemingly come quite close to uh, blows, as it were. Uh, but yeah, there are several crises this year. One, 1983, the Soviets accidentally shoot down a Korean, South Korean airliner, uh, a commercial jet, which uh, accidentally strays into Soviet airspace. Uh, we, and the Americans basically accuse the Soviets of cold-hearted murder. Um, more, more, even more ominous is Operation Able Archer. This was a NATO exercise which uh, uh, was designed to simulate how NATO would respond to a Soviet nuclear strike. Um, and it was significant it, because by that stage, the Soviet leadership had kind of got it into their hands that the United States might actually be preparing a first strike against Soviet territory. So they thought Operation Able Archer might be uh, basically a prelude to some kind of American strike. So basically, while this NATO exercise is going on, this Politburo are sort of huddled together in the Kremlin, half expecting uh, a nuclear strike to be launched against the Soviet Union. So the Soviets basically believed that the Americans were on the brink of war. And I think this is partly, as a, or mainly, maybe mainly as a consequence of the sort of rhetoric that the Reagan administration was using. Obviously, the operation passes, but it says something that, I mean, Soviet forces are put on a very high state of alert. So as I say, they're, 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 they're expecting war to break out at any moment. Obviously, the operation, you know, begins and ends and yeah and and fortunately the world is not tipped in tipped into into uh, into into a nuclear war um however a few months later a soviet uh, kgb agent defects to the west he actually defects to the british and he basically tells you know he tells you know he tells the western oh. intelligence services what the current state of mind is uh, in terms of the Soviet leadership. Apparently, I think he actually meets with Reagan personally and sort of delivers this message to Reagan personally. So, look, you know, these guys are basically extremely, you know, extremely scared. You know, they think war could break out at any moment. Um, and Reagan is sort of taken back and surprised. He says, oh, I, I can't believe they seriously think that. But he basically agrees that maybe it might be a good idea to try and start moderating his language. Another factor, and again, a lot of 
uh, you know, a lot of books mention this. So uh, presumably there is some, there is at least an element of truth in in in, in this uh, in this story. Um, but apparently, again, same year, I think it's a, I think it's the same year anyway. But anyway, early nineteen eighties. Reagan also watches um, an American television movie, um, which is all about what happens to um, an American town in the Midwest, I think, um, during a nuclear strike. Um, and you can actually find uh, you can find some footage of it on YouTube. It's very 1980s with very 1980s special effects. So, you know, from from the from perspective of 2020, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> It doesn't uh, um, look that uh, look that authentic, um, but nonetheless, you know, it has a really big impact on Reagan, <laughs> and Reagan sort of watches it and thinks, well, hang on a minute, um, you know, nuclear war may be a bad thing. Maybe it might be a good idea if we try to make sure that this doesn't actually happen. Um, so yeah, that sort of that apparently does have a significant psychological impact on Reagan and in, in terms of Reagan's thinking about nuclear weapons. I think there's also sort of growing concern in, in in Europe. I mean, again, this is a period where I think the peace movement begins to make its presence quite strongly felt in European politics. Various British leftist parties uh, become pretty sort of anti-nuclear in their philosophy. So we mentioned the social democratic government collapsing in West Germany. The British Labour Party, I think after 1983, also adopts a policy that becomes known as unilateralism. Um, essentially, they say that a, a, uh, a Labour government would unilaterally um, disarm its nuclear weapons. So it's the following year in which this guy basically appears on the political scene, Mikhail Gorbachev, who becomes a leader of the Soviet Union or chairman of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union um, in 1985. Even before 1985, though, it was becoming, I think, increasingly apparent that Gorbachev might well be the next in line. And I suppose he gets his first real public outing when he visits Britain in 1984. Um, and he meets with Thatcher and Thatcher in a press conference at the end of the meeting famously declares that at last she had found a communist I can do business with. Um, so effectively sort of giving the seal of approval to Gorbachev. Um, the following year, of course, um, um, Konstantin Chernenko uh, dies and Gorbachev, there's a sort of brief sort of power struggle or tussle in the Kremlin, but ultimately Gorbachev is chosen to be the next Soviet leader. And he was different in a number of ways. Most significantly, as I said on the third point there, he represents the next generation of Soviet leaders. So the pre three previous Soviet leaders, they'd all been guys in their 70s, I think. So, you know, Brezhnev sort of dies, I think, in 1982. Uh, I mean, he was practically sort of senile in his final years as uh, as as Soviet leader. He is then t he is then uh, replaced by Andropov. Um, and it should be said, Gorbachev was a sort of protege of Andropov. Andropov himself might have been, I'm not sure he would necessarily have been a reformer in the mould of Gorbachev, but he was certainly somebody who re recognised that there had to be changes. There was a sort of brief um, kind of anti-corruption campaign when, An when Andro Andropov becomes, uh, 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 becomes leader. Um, but he's not there long enough to make much of a difference. He dies, uh, um, and you know, after after a few months in office, he's replaced by Konstantin Chernenko, another septuagenarian, another guy who was in extremely poor health. I think they chose choose Chernenko on the on the basis that he's not going to be around for that long, and you know they can then finally uh, you know, it buys them some time before they decide exactly uh, who they want. Uh, to lead uh, the country on a more permanent basis. Anyway, Chernenko finally falls off the perch in 1985. And uh, Gorbachev, uh, as I say, eventually selected. Um, and yeah, 
by Soviet standards, you know, he is a relatively young man. I think he's 54 when he takes over as uh, as uh, as Soviet leader, which, you know, which by Soviet standards and for that matter, um, American standards in the 2020s um, is, uh, you, know, you know, was a relatively, you know, he's a, he's a young man. OK, so somebody who they think will be in office for, you know, for, for, for some time. Um, but yeah, represents the next generation. Significant that during the Second World War, um, you know, Gorbachev had been too young to actually serve in the Russian military. So the Great Patriotic War, which had really kind of shaped every Soviet leader from Stalin onwards, I suppose. Um, Gorbachev, as I say, you know, he was alive, but um, you know, the war obviously sort of impacted upon him. Um, uh, you know, he lost a lot of family members, as as did all Russian families, uh, um, uh, uh, as as a result of as a result of the war. But you know, he hadn't actually done any fighting himself. You know, unlike you know, unlike Khrushchev, who was right right in the middle of Stalingrad, for example, Brezhnev, who was also, I think, a political commissar during. Uh, uh during during the war um gorbachev as i say too young to have seen any sort of active service and i think that sort of shaped his you know that 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 was significant in terms of shaking shaping his his world view um another factor which i think is quite significant is that gorbachev comes of age politically speaking in the 1960s so so late 50s um early 60s we can put it that way you know he's a young communist um at the time when nikita khrushchev becomes leader and you know under khrushchev there was a sort of brief thaw um you know this period of de-stalinization in the late 50s um and that apparently also has a big impact on the young gorbachev um moreover you know there's a sort of new generation of communists who can see that the state of the soviet union in general was not good that the that the soviet economy was in pretty poor condition um so there is a sort of growing reformist clique in the communist party uh and which essentially you know gorbachev becomes the leading figure among them so he comes in as a you know as as very much a sort of reformist. Um, added to that, it's becoming increasingly clear that the Soviet empire in Eastern Europe is beginning to experience some quite significant problems. Um, the most difficult case being Poland. Um, solidarity emerges on the, in, on the Polish political scene in the early 1980s. Um, there's a sort of almost sort of revolution in Poland in 1981, which is eventually sort of quelled when the communist authorities um, impose martial law and a military government comes to power in 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 in, in Poland. Uh, the sol you know the leaders of Solidarity are locked up, but it's clear that the that, that that the political situation in Poland and in other you know Eastern European states is pretty uh, volatile. Um, Gorbachev comes in, as I say, and he's a reformist. Um, two big ideas that Gorbachev sort of talks about in terms of in terms of the way he thinks about the Soviet economy. One, uh, so, Soviet, well, not just Soviet economy, but Soviet society. Um, one idea he comes in is that he uses the word perestroika, in which he talks about this idea of restructuring. Perestroika, I think, roughly, loosely translates into restructuring in English. So, in other words, you know, he's a reformist. He knows that things are going to have to change, uh, and you know, this is a, begins to be applied to the Soviet economy. A second uh, watchword of the Gorbachev era is Glasnost, openness, um, and Gorbachev basically says that yes, there needs to be more freedom of information. Uh, almost, I suppose, a sort of partial, the emphasis on partial, but a partial democratization of the Soviet Union. Should be stressed, I mean, Gorbachev was a card carrying communist. So he, you know, he, be, he becomes leader of the Soviet Union, not to destroy the Soviet Union, but to save it. Um, but as I say, you know, he recognizes that there has to be change. Um, 
Gorbachev, when he comes in, also begins to embrace a whole series of new foreign policy and security ideas, many of which are strongly associated with the European peace movement, some of which had also figured in the West German government's policies of Ostpolitik. And actually the language, as I say on this slide here, the language Gorbachev uses in the late 1980s, very similar to the sorts of language that successive West German leaders had used when talking about uh, uh, um, you know, East-West relations. Um, so now suddenly, you know, there's a Soviet leader who is thinking and talking in, in pretty much the same way as you know, the social democratic politicians had in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, Vaclav Havel as well, the Czech sort of dissident leader later, who, 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 who becomes a leader of, uh, of uh, the Czech Republic. Um, I think it's Havel, now, now I'm sort of doubting, it might have been Dubček, now I think about it. Anyway, uh, but one of them sort of says, you know, after after the Prague Spring, which is sort of crushed by the Soviets in 1968, he says, you know, well, you know, we've had Hungary in 1956, uh, the, the, the Prague Spring in, 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 in 68, maybe next time it will be, you know, the, in Moscow, the Soviet Union, that there will be this sort of generational change. And arguably, you know, this is essentially what happens. Um, it, when Gorbachev comes to power. Um, other security ideas, uh, I won't labour these points, you can check them yourself, but he talks about this idea of common security, this idea that security is something that can be shared, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. Um, so, you know, countries could work together to kind of uh, strengthen their security situation. Another idea that's sort of floating around is, is the notion of reasonable sufficiency. That is, you don't have to have vast stockpiles of nuclear weapons, but actually a handful of nuclear weapons would be more than enough to deter potential adversaries. Um, also talks about this idea of a common European home. This is quite significant as well, because, you know, arguably mid 1980s, you see a sort of rebirth of the European idea. 1985, the same year as Gorbachev becomes leader. Um, the European Community um, establishes the Single European Act, which basically paves the way for the establishment of a single European market, which was going to come into effect at the end of 1992. Um, but it also lays the groundwork for what would subsequently become the European Union. So it basically starts laying down some of the ideas which would form the basis of the Maastricht Treaty, which was uh, um, negotiated in 1991. Uh, one idea sort of prefigured in the Single European Act, I think, is, is the notion that perhaps the European community would have some kind of single currency, you know, a European money. I think it's around this time that, you know, that, that the notion of a euro, this idea of a euro is actually sort of coined. Um, so there's a change in leadership in the Soviet Union. Obviously, though, um, in the United States, you still have Reagan, and Reagan, of course, as we've noted, is a sort of card-carrying cold warrior. And in fact, when Gorbachev comes to power, I think the evidence suggests is that the Soviets sort of look at the political situation in the United States and believe Reagan is basically a lost cause. That uh, they're, they're not going to be able to do much in the way of business with Reagan. That you know, Reagan, cold warrior, all the rest of it. So actually, initially. Gorbachev reaches out to the Europeans. I mean, we've already mentioned his meeting with Thatcher in 1984. I think he meets with Mitterrand shortly after he becomes Soviet leader. Uh, I think Mitterrand goes to Moscow, if I recall correctly. I'm not entirely sure of that. And yeah, has face-to-face -face discussions with, uh, with with the French president. And Mitterrand is impressed with Gorbachev. You know, and you know, like Thatcher, he thinks Gorbachev represents something new. Um, and he then flies to Washington to describe his conversation with Reagan. And he basically says to Reagan, look, I think this guy is serious. I think that, you know, I think, I think we, you know, I think we should take him, take him seriously. This is possibly somebody that, yes, we can indeed work with. Um, then there is Reagan himself. And by 1984, you could argue that the political situation in the United States is, is such that it, it is perhaps a propitious moment 
for the Americans to embark upon some major foreign policy um, initiative. Um, and I think there are several reasons for this. One, 1984, um, an election year. Uh, Reagan re-elected landslide victory in 1984 for, 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 for Reagan. So Reagan sort of politically secure, if you like, you know, he, he, he has been re-elected president. Secondly, though, I mean, there's a massive political scandal, I think, which sort of blows up, um, which becomes known as the Iran-Contra affair. Um, and... And as I say, it's a huge political scandal to the point at which, you know, there is serious talk of Reagan, like Nixon, being potentially impeached. I mean, Nixon wasn't impeached, but you know what I mean. <laughs> he would have been. <clears throat> um, but, you know, there's talk of, 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 of impeachment proceedings being launched against Reagan. Uh, I think one of the reasons why that doesn't happen is that the Democrats decide that they can't seriously impeach two Republican presidents in the space of 10 years. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it's a huge scandal which almost derails Reagan's presidency. Um, so he's under intense political pressure by, 90, by end of 84, beginning of 85, because of this, uh, you yeah, know, because of this scandal. Um, so a major foreign policy initiative potentially is a way of sort of distracting the American people away from this away from this scandal. Um, another factor is that Reagan's foreign policies have come, come under sort of mounting pressure. Um, there was criticism because of the fact that Reagan had not actually met his Soviet counterpart during his first term in office. Uh, although, you know, in fairness to Reagan, as he says, you know, they keep dying on him. So that is, you know, the, the, the Soviets have sort of got quite good at, uh, at uh, organising state funerals in the early 80s. Um, he does, though, send George Bush, his vice president, to Moscow to attend uh, uh, the funeral of uh, Chinenko. And we and Bush takes with him a letter that Reagan has written for Gorbachev, again, sort of expressing his desire to, to, to try and work to improve relations between the two countries. Then another point worth mentioning is that although very different sort of personalities, characters, different in temperament, um, nonetheless, you know, Reagan and Gorbachev do share some similar concerns, not least that because in their own different ways, they do abhor nuclear weapons. Now, that might seem like a strange thing to say about Reagan, given the fact, as we've already noted, that at the beginning of his presidency, Reagan basically undertakes this sort of massive rearmament program and including this emphasis on nuclear superiority um but one of the reasons why reagan is so committed to star wars is that um he thinks this system will actually um neutralize nuclear weapons it will basically make nuclear weapons obsolete so reagan does have this sort of utopian vision of a nuclear free world which gorbachev also shares I mean, they sort of come at it at different ways, but they both have this shared vision of a nuclear free world. Um, so this basically clears the way for a very intense bout of superpower symmetry uh, from the mid to late 80s. And Reagan and Gorbachev, they meet each other five times in the last four years. So you go from a situation of Reagan not having met his opposite number in the Soviet Union in his first term to, you know, meeting on a fairly regular basis with Gorbachev uh, during his second term. Um, so there are a series of high profile summits. And as I say on the second point, you know, you can make similarities with the sort of Nixon Brezhnev meetings um, of the early 1970s, which again is slightly ironic because basically Reagan had been very, very sort of critical of Nixon and uh, and his detente policies, but essentially you see mid to late 80s, Reagan emulating Nixon's policies. Uh, the first meeting between the two men is at the Geneva, uh, is at Geneva, I think in the context of ongoing negotiations uh, on, on, on strategic nuclear missiles. Um, and as I say, they do establish a good rapport. You know, they find, you know, they find that they get on quite well. There's a sort of personal chemistry there. Um, so it's sort of auspicious, um, you know, it sort of lays some of the groundwork for future meetings, but, you know, not much of, 
any real substance is discussed at Geneva. A much more significant meeting, though, is at Reykjavik, and I think I've got these slides in the wrong order, so, so uh, this picture should have been beforehand. Uh, but yes, we have a picture. So yeah, this is a picture of Reagan and Gorbachev meeting at Reykjavik. Um, and yeah, this is a much more significant summit meeting. Um, again, I, I weren't conscious that this has already gone on for too long, so I won't, I won't, I won't go into all the details. But for uh, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll discuss in a bit more detail um, on uh, uh, in our in, in our discussion class. But basically, you know, Reagan and Gorbachev they meet, and to their mutual surprise, they come within an ace of coming up with a comprehensive agreement on nuclear. Uh, disarmament. In other words, both the United States and the Soviet Union almost agreed to the complete abolition of their, of their I say strategic nuclear missile, but I think their entire nuclear forces. Um, but yes, it founders when Reagan says, well, Gorbachev basically says to Reagan, of course, you're going to have to get rid of the strategic defense initiative as well. <laughs> Gorbach and Reagan wasn't prepared to do that. He said, you know, this, this is, this, this is not defensive. You know, this is a defensive thing. It's not something that uh, that, that you need to worry about. Um, so, you know, as I say, having come within an ace of complete nuclear disarmament, uh, eventually, as I say, the agreement founders. The European reactions to all of this. Initially, the Europeans are happy at the relax relaxation of superpower tensions. You know, we talked about European concerns about the... Yeah, European concerns about the possibility of nuclear war between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. So anything that reduced tensions couldn't be a bad thing from the European point of view. Um, Europeans become more concerned after Reykjavik, though. Uh, and again, there are sort of parallels to be made with the sort of European feelings about uh, American Soviet detente in the early 1970s. You know, the fact that Reagan and Gorbachev are now meeting with one another. Uh, and you know, seemingly kind of cooking up deals without really including the Europeans in this process. Certainly, Thatcher, when she hears that Reagan has come within an inch of signing away the entire American nuclear arsenal, she is not at all happy, and she jumps onto a plane, flies straight over to Washington, and gives Reagan a real hand banging. You know, saying, "What the hell? You know, what the hell were you thinking, man?" Um, yet, yeah, whatever the reservations, you know, the Europeans can't really sort of uh, uh, um, stop this sort of process unfolding. The following year, Reagan and Gorbachev, they do sign a more limited treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which, incidentally, Trump has recently withdrawn from. Um, but this treaty... Um, basically abolishes a whole class of nuclear weapons. So, so these are the sort of medium range. From the European perspective, this is worrying simply because, as we've already noted, you know, cruise and Pershing missiles were deployed in Europe to counter the SS-20. So this could be taken as an indication of a loosening of America's nuclear umbrella. Uh, um, and so, you know, these missiles were there to be used against uh, uh, <clears throat> missiles which were targeting European countries. But yeah, whatever their reservations, the Europeans and, uh, you know, and uh, couldn't, couldn't really do anything to, to uh, stop this process from uh, unfolding. Uh, there's also the concern about, well, what might happen to the, to the European, uh, you know, to the British and French nuclear deterrents, you know, if, if, if Reagan and Gorbachev agreed between themselves, um, significant significant arms reductions maybe even comprehensive nuclear disarmament then obviously the british and the french would be under considerable pressure to follow suit so this is the situation in 1989 one other thing i would say about the sort of european reactions to the sort of reagan and gorbachev relationship is that i think there's a genuine sort of worry about that reagan was being too starry-eyed in terms of his in terms of his relations with Gorbachev, I mean, while the European leaders were sort of favourably impressed with Gorbachev, um, there's still an element of realism, I 
I think, in European thinking uh, in terms of in, in, in terms of how they view how they view Gorbachev. Reagan, though, I mean, having seems to sort of lurch from having been hard and cold warrior into developing what Lundestad refers to as a love fest between uh, between Reagan and Gorbachev. So there's a general feeling that maybe Reagan is starting to get a little bit carried away in terms of his relationship with, with Gorbachev. Something that I think Reagan's successor, George H.W. Bush, who had been Reagan's vice president during the 1980s, but something that, uh, that uh, 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 the, Bush, the incoming Bush administration, I think to some degree sort of share the European concerns about Gorbachev. Again, a feeling, as I say, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that Reagan had been a bit too carried away. Um, Bush's national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, uh, declares beginning of 1989 that the Cold War is not over. So essentially sort of downplaying the significance of the new detente between the United States and the Soviet Union. There's also a general feeling, I think, within the US government at that time that Gorbachev had talked a good game, that Gorbachev, you know, the rhetoric that had come from the Kremlin had improved dramatically under Gorbachev's leadership. Um, what he hadn't done, though, is made, you know, significant substantive changes to Soviet foreign policy or its national security policies. And above all else, you know, the Bush administration could point to the fact that Europe still remained divided that you still had communist governments in Eastern Europe. Um, so there's a decision, I think, almost to try and test Gorbachev. Condoleezza Rice, who is on the, uh, who, who is, uh, on the uh, uh, Bush's National uh, Security Council, obviously later on goes on to become um, Secretary of State under, 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 under his son's administration um, in the 2000s. But they decide upon this policy of testing Gorbachev, essentially saying, look, if you mean what you say, uh, then you know, we're going to have to see some sort of action. And the test case, I think, is very much Eastern Europe. Um, and of course, 1989 is indeed the year of miracles, where a number of decisions are taken that, that ultimately lead to the collapse of the Soviet empire in Eastern Europe. Um, Poland, you know, events start in Poland, basically. We, we've already noted the Polish revolution in the early 1980s, the imposition of martial law, solidarity, you know, the leadership of solidarity locked up. By the, by the late 1980s, though, the communist authorities in Poland had kind of reluctantly come to the conclusion that there needed to be some sort of political agreement. You have the round table talks in 1980, yeah, in 1988 involving the Communist Party, Solidarity and the Church, in which a, a, an agreement is effectively brokered where there will be partial elections in Poland the following year. Um, one consequence of this is that for the first time in its history, uh, 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 you know, there are you know reasonably free elections in 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 in, in a communist country. Solidarity win, you know, overwhelming unanimously. I think in all, all all the seats are contested and are then able to engineer the 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 arrival of a new non-communist government under Tadeusz Mazowiecki. Um, so Poland, as I say, you know, a test case in the 1980s, and all these events happen without any direct Soviet intervention to stop this process. Before that, the Soviets withdraw from Afghanistan um, in 1988, and then Gorbachev gives a very notable speech, December 1988, to the United Nations General Assembly, in which he basically renounces the Brezhnev doctrine. He basically says that the Soviet Union will not use military force to prop up various communist governments in Eastern Europe. So effectively, sort of giving the green light to the various opposition movements in Eastern Europe. Um, I think one reason why he does that is that he's sort of laboring under the impression that if there were democratic elections, that the communist parties in these countries 
would also in reformed communist parties in these countries would 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 do reasonably well. Obviously, that's a sort of massive miscalculation because, as as, as Poland showed, that when there were free elections, that communists were simply kind of kicked out of office. But he was sort of labouring under this under this uh, misperception or this this misconception that uh, that that perhaps the communist authorities were rather more popular than was actually the case. Um, it was announced as a unilateral withdrawal of 50,000 troops, uh, 5,000 tanks from Eastern Europe, again as part of this sort of new detente policy, reduction of Soviet armed forces by 500,000 men. Um, and then there's a series of events uh, in Eastern Europe, especially in the autumn of 1989, I remember them pretty well. Um, a key moment comes when the government in Hungary decides to open its uh, open its borders and allows thousands and thousands of East German refugees to cross over into Western Europe. And this sets off a succession of events which sort of cascade and culminate with the opening of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989. Again, there's some confusion surrounding that about you know, why the communist authorities do that. Uh, basically, you know, crowds converge on the wall on this day. The communist authorities uncertain what to do. And so somebody somewhere takes the decision to sort of temporarily, as they see it, to open the wall to allow people to cross. Of course, once they do that, then, you know, that they had crossed the Rubicon, as it were, that the wall was never going to be closed again after that had happened. So 9th of November 1989, which Timothy Garton Ash uh, describes as the sort of European, um, which brings the Cold War to an end. Um, but arguably, you know, the collapse of communism, and I, I mean, you get sort of various dates, well, I suppose two main dates for, 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 for the end of the Cold War, um, the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe or the collapse of the Soviet Union itself at the end of 1991. My own preferred date is 1989, simply because um, if you consider that the Cold War begins with Europe's division in 1989, then logically it makes sense to say that it comes to an end when Europe is unified in 1989, when the various communist governments in Eastern Europe uh, uh, collapse. However, there were a number of questions which still needed to be addressed. Not least, and again, we will get onto this in the next class, is the future of the two German states. Um, a non-communist government, a Christian democratic government, is elected in East Germany uh, after, you know, after, 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 after the collapse. Of the East German government, uh, but there are still two German states in 1989 and 1990. So the, there is the issue of unification, and it, and uh, and it was not yet certain exactly how that was going to pan out. The other que major question is: with the Cold War ending, what was the role of the United States going to be in a post Cold War Europe? And I think there were, you know, there were certainly. Uh, ideas, maybe even fears expressed that with the Cold War over, you could look forward to the United States again retreating into a policy of isolationism. I will end.